is none are relevant other than I will discuss or mention some um, medications that are FDA approved but use off label for uveitis. So I want to give you start with a clinical vignette. So this is a 23 year old female, previously healthy, um, had uneventful LASIK, and after her LASIK surgery um, done in another country, she had um, an episode of very uh, acute, severe anterior non-granulomatous uveitis. Based on that um, episode, she was then worked up and she has HLEP27 and has had recurrent anterior uveitis ever since in this particular eye. So this was an episode that she had had that ended up very severe and she ended up having Bombay. The patient was being treated with aggressive topical steroids and um, daily iridotomies, laser iridotomies, because they closed every day, three days in a row, at which point then she was referred to the uveitis service. So um, after being treated with systemic steroids, it did calm down. And the patient then went back to her country still taking the prednisone. And so she went back to her original ophthalmologist who was like, well, you're quiet and you have this terrible cataract, I'm gonna fix it. Honestly, they did a beautiful job, right? I mean, to go from this to this, and the eye wall is nicely in place, and they lysed the sneaky eye, the pupil looks nice and round, great, right? So the patient finished off her bottle of prednisone that I had given to her, and then she was happy with her result, came back to the US, like that. So have we done this patient any favors by doing her cataract surgery at that time? My point that I want to make here is that there's a right and wrong time to do the surgery, right and wrong circumstances to do the surgery, not that she had a clinically significant cataract that needed to be removed. So we'll go over some of that um, in my talk today. These are other images just to show she had a lot of sinichiae as a result of that So cataract formation in uveitis is very common um, because of chronic uh, and long-standing inflammation in the eye and long-term steroid use. But to be honest, I wish that I didn't have to give this talk. I wish that these things were well treated so that these patients would not develop cataracts. And that's really, in the end, my goal. I am so happy to not operate on these patients. I'm happy to see these patients that have a high incidence of um, uveitic cataracts to all be zero. That would be my goal. And so that would be another talk, or you can refer the patients to me for a second opinion and I can help you get the patients under better control so that they don't have to put up with chronic inflammation, so that they don't have to use long-term steroids. And that is possible. It's also sad because a lot of these patients are much younger than our standard cataract patients. Some of them, go blind, not just from cataract, but other complications of chronic inflammation that unfortunately cannot be fixed surgically. And some of them go blind at such an early age, they don't finish their education, they don't join the workforce, etc. So the management is very can be very complicated because there's so many other sequelae that can come with chronic intraocular inflammation. And you have to be aware that any of these things or all of these things can interfere with your cataract surgery. So we will go through some of them today. And what are the indications for cataract surgery? So phacoantigenic uveitis, you have to operate immediately. Most commonly, you're gonna be looking at a visually significant cataract in a quiet eye. So what I didn't put on this list is a visually significant cataract in a non-quiet eye, other than these other circumstances. Like if you have a very, very young child at risk for amblyopia, then you might um, consider other circumstances. But in general, if we're talking about a patient that you can get under control. It's not an emergency. It's not like they also have a retinal detachment that needs to be repaired right away. Um, let me, I will tell you some pearls on how to manage that medically. But I want to present to you 10 pearls for successful uveitic cataract surgery. So first is you need to expect the unexpected because anything can happen and stay calm. So what I always do is I just come prepared mentally ask and tell everyone in the room please you know have this 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 all on hand if I don't use any of these things that's great but I do want them in the room because if I need the anterior vitrectomy and you know no one in the room knows how to set it up and I have to wait 30 minutes that's not a good idea um, so I always have these things in the room and I 
will show you examples of how I used all of them. But I want to give you an example of um, a very difficult case that you know I knew there was going to be difficulty, and um, yeah, it was very challenging. So this uh, man has ankylosing spondylitis. Very unfortunately, he basically never got the right treatment systemically until it was it was very far gone. So he's wheelchair bound, and this is as far as he can lift his head. So you can see he's using his frontalis to lift his upper lid because he cannot bring his chin up higher than that. This is me trying to examine him at the slit lamp. He cannot get his chin in the chin rest. And what you're not seeing is he's got a brother and a cousin behind him pushing him forwards so that I can even get a view. Um, so here he is in the operating room. This is, by the way, after I've sent him to rheumatology, he's now not only on oral prednisone, he's on a TNF-alpha inhibitor, etc. Um, so when we lay him down supine, his head does not reach the um, headrest. So we had to put these pillows just so that his head wasn't floating in the air. But obviously, I can't put the microscope above him and see the eye. So we're getting ready to recline the bed um, this is actually James Tan's wife, who is our anesthesiologist for the case. So you see, they're strapping him in because they're expecting he might slide down and hit the floor. So now they've tilted the bed as far as it can possibly go. It, the bed can't go any further than that. And you see his head is still at a 45 degree angle. That's the view from his feet. And because of his neck um, is fused and the contour of his neck, they cannot intubate him. All the weight of his body is sitting right here on his neck, on the back of his neck. So he's not comfortable, um, and they can't give him general anesthesia. So I just have to operate as fast as I can. Um, so here I am giving the block. Um, and at that time, I was probably like my first or second year as an attending. I didn't even have a resident or a medical student to like assist me. So here's the patient's body, and I'm like squished here. My like right shoulder is right up against the patient's body. I was very, very uncomfortable. I will show you the video of the case in a moment. Okay, so pearl number two, and I think most people understand this, is you need to wait a period of time of documented quiescence before taking your patient to the OR. And I stress documented, because you cannot just trust that the patient says they didn't have a you need to examine that patient. So usually we talk about um, remission or quiescence for three months. So there's no um, randomized controlled trial to prove this, but generally speaking, the UVITIS community agrees on this minimum of three months kind of rule. And what we mean by quiescence is uh, rare or less than um, rare anterior chamber cells, less than one plus flare, can't, sometimes can't make the flare go away because it's due to chronic inflammation that has caused a leaky blood nucleus barrier. No active retinitis, no active CME, and any infectious causes completely addressed. But this three-month rule is just a guideline. I would say there are many cases, and maybe I see my fair share of more of the severe ones, but I think three months is not enough. So especially if the patient is at um, has had very severe, chronic um, inflammation, very difficult to control inflammation, three months might not be enough. I always ask the patient, especially if we are going, we're planning to do the cataract surgery, I make them come every month for those three months. I also make them come one week before surgery, just to make sure that the eye is still quiet. I had a patient who was quiet for a long time, we planned the cataract surgery, everything was ready to go, they came for a pre-op appointment one week before, raging inflammation. I said, what happened? Did you change something? So he went to the, um, for his pre-op clearance, and the um, primary care doctor said, oh, stop all your immunosuppressive drugs before surgery, because you can't go to <laughs> surgery with them. Well, that's what happened. So um, whatever you need to do to get the patient into remission, do that, but don't change it at the last moment. Okay, so give perioperative steroids, and that may be topical, may be oral, et cetera. But the point 
that I just made is don't make any drastic changes to the patient's regimen. You finally got them quiet. You sustain them for a period of quiescence. You documented it, you're ready to go. Don't make any changes to that and risk that they become active right before your surgery. Consider pre-treating these patients. So I almost always do. So I always start topical NSAIDs to prevent CME because these patients are at very high risk for developing post-operative CME. So I always start that before. I owe, if they are on topical steroids, and they almost always are on at least a little bit, I always start that um, one week ahead, at least QID, but depends on what they've already been on. Basically, I escalate the dose starting one week before. If they are uh, uh, a viral hepatitis, I increase them to the treatment dose of their antiviral one week before surgery. And I consider giving um, oral steroids in patients who have very severe autoimmune-mediated uveitis, which you can go up as high as one milligram per kilogram per day. So people sometimes ask me, how many milligrams? Well, I calculate by the patient's weight. If the patient has been on chronic steroids, do, give, do consider giving them a stress dose of IV steroid on the day because their adrenal glands may not produce enough steroid. I'm not saying you have to use this for every single patient. Um, I'm talking about the ones who have been on a lot of oral steroids in the past. Okay, so here's an example. 70-year-old adult patient with non-infectious, let's say chronic recurrent anterior uveitis. Maybe they also have HLA-B27. Maybe they also have rheumatoid arthritis, let's say, okay? And maybe they, like that patient that I showed with the ankylosing spondylitis, been on oral prednisone for many years. So whatever they were on pre-op to get them under control, whether it's topical or systemic, I keep that going. And if it's, um, I might even increase that. So I'm gonna start the topical NSAIDs at least four days before, and I start the prednisone because he weighs 70 kilograms, I'm giving 70 milligrams. I start it daily at least two days before. On the day of surgery, because they're going to be NPO, I don't want them to get you know, um, acid reflux or something, I usually um, skip the steroid on that day, and I ask the, um, I ask the anesthesiologist to administer IV cellular mandrel. Okay, so don't use topical anesthesia alone unless it's a very, very straightforward case. And I mean, the cases that I'm gonna show you are more complicated, and that's why I'm saying, um, you don't know what will happen, so make sure that the patient is comfortable, you're comfortable. I usually give um, a block in these cases, or general anesthesia sometimes. So pearl number five is about um, synecheolysis. So usually I use the uh, viscoelastic cannula to perform the synecheolysis, and that can be very simple to do, and I'll show you that, um, but be ready with a hoop and hook. Can you turn the lights off, please? So this is just a straightforward way of using the um, viscoelastic cannula through the paracentesis. Um, just when you're going in to fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic, then you, you're already in there, and you just use the cannula, and you're going to enter in an area that does not have posterior synechiae. And in this case, there's a like three quadrants that doesn't, so it's easy to figure out where to enter from. And you just sweep laterally. Okay, and you can see the synechiae break. You can feel it, and then um, you visco dissect. I mean, uh, visco dilate in that area, and it dilates nicely. So that's really simple to do, um, and it works very nicely. And probably all of you didn't even need me to show you that. But this is unfortunately very dark. But sometimes you have 360 of synechiae. And even preoperatively at this lab, it's hard to see where the opening is. But you try to record that in your chart so that you know that's where you enter. So I tried with the Helon cannula, and I just met a lot of resistance. <coughs> so I'm using the Kuglin hook here because the tip is curved. So what can happen in these really chronic in, uh, inflamed cases is it's not just synechiae at the pupillary border, but it extends beyond where you can see. And so if you meet a lot of resistance, don't just keep pulling with the cannula because you can actually um, tear the iris or uh, tear the root. Um, so I use the Kuglin hook to like gently dissect and go further and further posterior. This case will also end up needing hooks um, at, after we're all done. So you might need to make more than one paracentesis so that you have better access, especially in these 360 degrees of synechiae cases. Sorry, it's so dark, it's hard to see. Um, another trick that I haven't made a video of that I should um, is let's say the patient has a um, iridotomy, a 
probably iridectomy. You can actually put a paracentesis very close to that, put your viscoelastic cannula through the iridotomy, and then inject the helon in that area and go towards the pupil and break through the synechiae that way. Um, it's a very nice way to do that as well. Um, okay, pearl number six is to beware of the pupillary membrane, even if you didn't notice it at the lamp. That ha I have uh, run into that where the pupil doesn't dilate well, and I assume that it's just posterior synechiae, and it turns out that there is a membrane that I have to peel first before I can go and get the um, go towards the um, synechiae. But this is like an obvious case, and this is the one that I showed at the very beginning, the HLAB27 woman that went into Bombay. Um, so this is like we're going to go in and remove all the synechiae and explant the IOL because it was she was so inflamed. So that membrane did not peel easily. I tried to grasp it. It was very difficult to. And there's no opening. So I have to create an opening, which I use the uh, sharp end of the cystitome to create the opening. And it's a very thick fibrotic membrane. So eventually, after making this hole to enter it, I use the red mill scissors to cut it. And a lot of these um, fibrotic capsules sometimes you also can use the scissors, and I'll show that in um, a subsequent case. And that works really nicely, except that you may have to come at it from different angles, so you might need a couple of paracentesis wounds to be able to get at the right angle to remove the membrane. Okay. Um, so beware of a floppy iris, and this doesn't only happen in patients who are taking uh, medication for their prostate. Um, it's very common in uveitic eyes. And don't be afraid of using hooks. You can use one hook, you can use many hooks. Um, I prefer hooks, but you can also use a malleolian ring. That is up to your personal preference. In these particular cases, it's different than um, straightforward IFIS because it's not just that the pupil is meiotic, that the pupil is atrophic. It has maybe been synced in one area, but not the other. So you may not need to do 360 mm -hmm. degrees of pupillary dilation. You might just need to use one or two hooks. Um, but a lot of these patients have problems with pupillary dilation because of the, not just because they have uh, posterior synechiae, but because their iris sphincter has been atrophied, their iris stroma can be atrophied, and they can have little or zero response to pharmacologic dilation. So you, you have to have like multiple methods on hand to try to combat this. Um, so I'm gonna show you how to use the, uh, my method for using iris hooks. It's very simple, but as I said, if you want to use a malleolian ring, you can do that too. Um, I would not, at the end of the case, suture the iris simply for cosmesis. Less is more in these patients. So the less surgery you do for these types of patients, the better. You don't want to induce uh, more inflammation unnecessarily just because you're trying to fix the iris for cosmesis. They have bigger problems. Okay, so this is my technique for putting the iris hooks. I use a 27 gauge needle to make the paracentesis for it because it's small, it fits the hook, and I don't need to worry about hydrating it at the end. I put all the hooks in first without grasping the iris border. And then after they're all in, then I hook the iris border. And then after that, then I tighten all of them. The reason is because if you put one in, hook it, tighten it, it might pull the whole iris to the other side and it's hard to reach on the other side. And I put them basically all radial except for the ones that are gonna be near the wound. So the if I'm going to put my main incision here, I actually point this one more this way so that I really make sure that the iris right here is far away from the wound. And then tighten all of them. And at the end, it's really easy um, to remove them. I just loosen up the little tabs and then just yank them out after you make sure you're, you've um, loosened it from the pupillary border. So you see, like, I'll do it kind of step by step. I don't pull it all the way tight until the end. And that's where I'm gonna put my incision because I made this one not radial, but tangential. So at the end, I'm loosening those tabs, and then you can just thoroughly pull them out, yank them out, like that. It's very simple. Okay, and that is how that pupil ended up So, uh, 
Uh, pearl number eight is to beware of a fibrotic anterior capsule. You have to have many capsorexis techniques in your armamentarium if you want to be able to do these kinds of cataracts. So I suggest using Tripan Blue because oftentimes, especially in the really fibrotic ones, um, well, I'll show you an example. They can be more elastic in children and they can, be, they can tend to tear more because of the um, pathology in these cases. And sometimes the fibrosis is so thick that the capsorexis won't tear. So I will show you that in a second. Um, is this thing ready for you? I think this is a different video. Um, sorry, this is not the video I was thinking of showing you. This is actually a video that just shows that uh, there, this, this patient had um, PUK and corneal melt and had a lot of corneal haze, so we actually had to use the blank pipe. But that is actually not the video I wanted to show you, which is unfortunate. Um, sorry, so the video I was going to show you was of the man with the um, ankylosing spondylitis with the feet in air. So what happened is, after I did the synecolysis, and put the, put the hooks, I put Tripan Blue to visualize the anterior capsule, which looked very fibrotic. I um, tore the anterior capsule, and then I could not get at the lens, no matter what. I tried to baco at the highest um, baco setting, didn't make a dent in it. So I was wondering what happened. So I put more Tripan Blue, only to realize I didn't open the capsule at all. Um, there were multiple layers of a fibrotic anterior capsule. So once I stand it again, I realized, wow, that big white thing is not just the cataract. There's also like a really thick capsule there. And I tried every instrument to try to get at it. I used the anterior retractor. I used the MVR blade. Nothing went through that fibrotic anterior capsule until I went and looked everywhere for an area where it was not as thick. I stuck the MVR blade right in there, made a hole, and then I had to use the retinal scissors to cut, 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 cut. And uh, recently we had a case of a 19-year-old with Coates disease and a traumatic cataract who had that same kind of fibrotic anterior capsule where we had to, um, in that case we didn't have an NVR blade so we used a uh, one millimeter side port straight blade to stab the anterior capsule because there's no way that the capsular, um, capsular forces weren't doing anything um, and we couldn't even make a nick in the capsule. So we used the um, blade to make in the capsule and then cut with retinal scissors. So like I showed before, you may need to make multiple paracentesis uh, wounds in order to cut from different angles. Okay, so pearl number nine is, I my preference is I like to put a three-piece monofocal IOL, and in some patients I leave them aphagic. So the question is IOL or no IOL, and this used to be kind of an area of debate, uh, but I think now, most uveitis specialists would say that with newer techniques, new the new lenses that we have available today, and assuming the patient is under good control, you can put an IOL. Um, so most, I would say, like 99% of my patients receive IOLs. Um, but if there's a lot of chronic inflammation expected, or this is a patient you've really had a hard time to get under control, and you kind of know their pattern, that is, this is just gonna keep continuing, then I leave that patient aphagic. So that, that man that I just showed with the uh, ankylosing spondylitis, I left him aphagic. Kids also, that's a different thing, I would um, tend to leave them aphagic as well. Um, I, again, no hard and fast rules, you know, like for example, I did a 15 year old with JIA who was well controlled, I put an IOL in that kid, but. Um, so the choice of IOL, you want to consider zonular instability. That is why I like the three piece. Even if there is no zonular instability at the time of cataract surgery, I still like to put a three piece IOL. My reasoning is, these are young patients and they have, chronic, they have a chronic disease. You don't know what's gonna to happen to them in the next several decades. They can continue to have inflammation, which then can affect the zonules. So um, in the last, say, eight or nine years, I have re brought two patients back where 
I had to suture the three piece to the iris because it dehissed due to progressed zonular instability um, from chronic inflammation. Um, there are a lot of, the current generation lenses are very good, so I don't really have a preference of which brand or anything. Um, in the past, we used to say that maybe the heparin coated eye walls were better. I think all of the um, current generation lenses are, are just fine. I would only just say avoid silicone lenses because again, you don't know what's gonna happen to this patient in the next couple decades. What if they need to have a retinal detachment repair with silicone oil? You just don't know. And ACI walls to create too much um, synechiae and endocelial cell loss and can create a lot of problems in these patients, so I try to avoid them. So this is, um, uh, an example of what I was saying. So this patient had cataract surgery, not even with me, someone else, um, you know, long before I was even in practice. And you can see that they put it in the bag, but then later the lens dropped. So luckily, you know, that the original surgeon had put a three piece. So all I needed to do was um, suture to the iris. And I didn't have to explant or exchange. Um, so you, to do these, you just need to know how to do like mechanical suture fixation uh, or scleral fixation of these lenses um, and that worked out very well so I had another case recently where I had done the cataract surgeries a couple of years ago and there was zonular instability at that time so I put a three-piece eye wall with um, a CTR and because of continued inflammation that patient's eye wall dropped and again I didn't have to exchange it I just sutured it. Okay so um, this is very important the end of the surgery is not the end of the story at the end of the surgery, you can pat yourself on the back, everything went well, lens is in the bag, everything looks good, but that's not the end of the story. Don't forget that this patient can get into trouble after that, even if your surgery was perfect. You need to monitor these patients much more frequently than your normal standard um, senile cataracts, okay? So maybe you have pre-printed material, use you know, prednisolone, QID, for a week, deeper, like that. I don't give those these patients that same regimen. I don't give them the instructions and say bye bye, you know, see the optometrist or like, you know, see you in a month. I see them very regularly, very uh, constantly. Um, so they need more care. And if everything goes well, great, that's fine. But I think you would feel very badly if you did a perfect surgery. The patient did followed all your directions and they had a lot of postoperative inflammation and had complications. So what is the postoperative regimen? It's not the same for every patient, but these are some general guidelines. So uh, whatever systemic immunosuppression they were on, again, I don't change or stop. Um, I give them intense topical steroids. Now, whether you wanna do prednisolone, whether you wanna do Durazol, I'll leave that up to you. Um, use more than you normally do. Um, and in the patients that I give oral steroids, I taper the oral steroids relatively quickly, but I keep the topical steroids going very, going a lot. And I'll give you an example in a second. I use topical NSAIDs for all these patients because again, they have a high incidence of CME. And I do um, continue to dilate the pupil. So in that example that I gave earlier, the 70 kilogram patient, um, this is what, so remember I had started the 70 milligrams of prednisone two days before. The day of surgery I didn't give the prednisone because the patient got IV steroids. So now we're at post-op day one. They're gonna take 70 milligrams. Post-op day two, 70 milligrams. Post-op day three, 60 milligrams. So it's 70, 70, 60, 60, 50, 50, et cetera, et cetera, until they get either to zero or back to whatever their baseline was, whether it was like five or seven and a half or 10 milligrams. Okay, this is assuming everything I give them intensive topical steroids. So as an example, um, Pred Forte every two hours while awake. Maybe also a, um, st uh, an ointment containing steroids at bedtime. And that I will continue until I see zero cells. Not like, oh, you look better at post-op week, I'm going to taper it. Like, I don't taper it until the patient has zero cells. And then I keep continue the NSAID cyclopegin for several weeks. And the top of the antibiotics, I don't do anything different than the normal ones. And again, I'm watching them very carefully, so I'm watching their progress. And I don't want to see them get better. I want to see them go to zero inflammation before I relax. 
And if you have a patient with really difficult to control uh, post-operative inflammation, like maybe you used my um, guidelines or maybe you didn't and it's already kind of like, oh, what do I do? The patient is massively inflamed afterwards and you know, my surgery was perfect. I, I don't know if anything went wrong during surgery. Is, no, it, these patients can do that. So you have to have some um, backup plan just in case. So you can give a subtenons or even intravitreal um, steroid injection. You can give um, intracameral TPA to dissolve the fibrin in the anterior chamber. Think about adjusting their systemic medication. So one easy thing to do is just increase their oral steroid. If that's not enough, they might need a change in their systemic medication, but that won't have an effect right away. If you change their biologics, if you change their antimetabolites, it will take some time for that to happen. And usually if you're in a situation, you don't have a luxury of a month or two months to wait. If all else fails, explant the eye wall. And you also have to think of all the other potential complications that you may have, that uh, it's like CME is a very common one, um, easily treated with intravitreal steroid, but you know other things like cocooning of the eye wall, you may have to explant the eye wall. Um, most of these patients will need a YAG. Uh, I would wait until you know they recover from the cataract surgery, they're quiet for like maybe another three um, so that's all I have, and I'm happy to take any questions or um, about these kind of cases. Um, and I'm not trying to scare you. Most of the cases don't need all of these fancy things and don't need you to worry about all this stuff. Um, again, I think my goal for these kinds of patients is, number one, don't develop the cataract in the first place. And two, you know, don't develop all the sneaky eye and other complications so that the cataract surgery goes very smoothly and normally, just like your other standard cataracts. And then all the other things that I presented are the outliers. <laughs>
um, so that may cause a bias. But these patients have other options, not just topical steroids only for you know years and years and years. Now we have the whole panel. Anyone have any questions for any of our speakers? Dr. Francais, I have a question. Um, initially, I learned that uh, after filtering surgery, it was important to have a bleb. And uh, we always fight to have a bleb. Um, you mentioned, and it's true now, that uh, when uh, we use uh, tubes or valve, if the pressure starts going up, it's important to decrease the production of aqueous. What happens? Why the, the aqueous is not uh, maintaining the bleb? And in this case, it's a risk factor uh, for encapsulation. So there's several forces that uh, affect capsule formation and uh, capsule permeability in tube shunts. So, uh, and that is for tube shunts, not for trabeculectomy. So, um, movement of the plate is bad. It will cause thicker capsules and less permeable. Um, aqueous, so exposure to aqueous during the production of the capsule uh, will cause a thicker, less permeable capsule. So, um, that's one reason we believe that a non valved implants. Uh, work a little bit better than valve implants because they're not exposed to aqueous in the first six weeks before the tube opens. Um, but that's why we use aqueous suppressants. So if, if, if you can decrease the amount of aqueous force that's going into the, into the pleb area, then uh, you will decrease the amount of encapsulation and, and limit the hypertensive blood phase. Stents, uh, the transconjugal approach um, versus the uh, opening up of external. Um, you noticed that with patients with severe glaucoma, the big open external versus the transconjugal approach works a little bit better. Um, you know, just one of those things. Or both of them, just as equivalent. Yeah, you know, in, in, in my, this is again, my in my hands, I find that the when I open the conjunctiva and dissect tenons away from the sclera and put and put mitomycin in that space and then place the distal end of the, of the device in that sub-tenon space, I do get lower pressures. Um, in a handful of patients, I do a limited tenonectomy to thin out tenons in that area, um, especially in the, the revisions where there's kind of thick uh, tenons capsule there. Um, I just I find that it's it's a little more reliable in terms of making sure you're not intratenon. The transconjunctival approach I think is easier than the in abinternal approach, and it's easier to get the distal tip, leave it in the subconjunctival space. But it's still possible to get tenons, you know, ballooning up uh, around the tip. So I think that's probably why you get less encapsulation. But the key there is is not to have the tip in tenon. You mentioned that you like the um, MIGS approach for patients with like the pressures of 30. What about the normal tensive patients? The you know, normal pressure is 15 and so, but they're still advancing. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, normal tension glaucoma, so if your target is in the 10 to 11, 12 range, then you're more limited. MIGS cannot generally reliably get you to that level. Um, so we'll, we'll go with filtration surgery in those patients. Mostly. If a patient refuses to have filtration surgery, then I will combine uh, MIGS, so I'll combine an angle based MIGS with uh, Micropulse or ECP to try to get them down in the lower teeth. And sometimes you can get them down to that level, but it's not as reliable. So I'm going to ask Dr. Liu a question. Do you think with the, the MyLoop, with the septo capsulotomy device, sublingual anesthesia, do you think that all of these things are kind of being developed to push us into perhaps office-based cataract surgery? I think that these things sort of uh, get developed in, in parts, you know, for their individual uh, te technology. So I'm not sure that there is a coordinated effort to, to try to do that, but I think that uh, when we do have enough of these uh, techniques and and uh, uh, 
uh, technologies that, that we can go into office uh, space, uh, it, it may happen in the future. Any other questions from the audience? This is a question for Dr. Lee. Uh, in UVA cataract surgery postoperatively, do you find any roles for intracamerals, antibiotics, steroids, etc.? Um, that's a great question. Are you talking about like DexaQ? I haven't tried DexaQ. I really would like to try it. Um, if the audience, anyone in the audience doesn't know what we're talking about, we're talking about an injectable, um, I think, fluosinolide. Um, you at the end of the cataract surgery, you put the lens in, lens is in the bag, you've hydrated the wounds, you inject this device uh, or it, it, this medication, it comes out in liquid form, and once it touches the aqueous, becomes a solid pellet, and it's intended to remain in the sulcus space, so between the, um, between the iris stroma and the capsule, and it's supposed to stay there, um, and it dissolves over the course of a couple of weeks. And the idea is that you don't have to give the patient any topical steroids after surgery. It's not specifically intended for uveitis cases, it's intended for all cataract surgeries. So the patient doesn't have to remember to use a steroid afterwards. They don't, you don't need to instruct them how to taper because they, it naturally weans. Um, it was FDA approved a couple months ago. Um, I haven't been able to get our surgery center to buy it for us but I really would like to try it. Um, I think this is just my guess that um, it would, because it is formulated for normal cataracts, I think it would be by itself not enough for uveitic cataracts. But um, I'm, I don't have any personal experience. Do you? <laughs> for Dr. Lee, uh, Humera, it was my impression that it's approved for posterior uveitis. Uh, is it appropriate for us to use it in conjunction with a rheumatologist for strictly anterior? Yes, yes. Yeah, it works great. In kids too, it works great. And quick question for Dr. Francis. Uh, if you're doing a combined cataract and uh, mix, whether it's a high eye stent or a trabecular KDV, what do you do with your uh, glaucoma medications in the post-operative period? So uh, I keep them on all their glaucoma medications, but you know, post on day one. Um, the only exception is if it's a very mild patient uh, and they're on maybe one medication, I'll, I'll take them off of that. Um, and then I'll start tapering it uh, after about a week, but more likely up to three weeks. I, I start tapering after about three weeks. One thing that I didn't mention, which is important, is the, the post-trabecular mix patients are actually quite susceptible to steroid response. And so um, I've tried to switch almost exclusively to lodopredinol in those patients postoperatively. If you do have inflammation or you do have you know, blood reflux, you can start them on prednisolone the first few days, and then I always try to taper them over to uh, Lodomax or, or Flormethalone after that time period. Is that for all mix? All mix, all, all angle-based mix. So you know, your stents, your trabectome, your we found the same thing actually with SciPass as well. So. Perfect. Well, we're coming to the end of the meeting, so just some reminders. Make sure to fill out that 